spend some time talking about decision making and um, that it's important for us to, to know and realize that as kingdom people, how we have to make decisions in our life, especially really, really tough decisions. And um, so I started part one last week, and I, I, in part one, uh, I, I talked about the, um, the principles, the, the characteristics that we have to embody so that when we get to a place where we actually have to make the decisions, we already have that as part of our DNA, right? It's, it's, it's something that's already in us. We don't have to go searching for it. As, as kingdom people, these things are already part of, of our DNA. And, and, I, and I said there were four, four aspects. I called them building blocks. And very quickly, they are, uh, we belong to God, not ourselves. So when we make tough decisions, are we actually uh, realizing that the decision that I'm making, I'm making not because uh, I belong to myself, but I belong to God? The second one is our lives serve his purpose first, not our own. So we, we can't make decisions selfishly. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was praying that the cup would pass from him. He says, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Right? It's always the decisions that we make always have to be to serve his purpose. The third thing is we must know God. How do we know what he wants if we don't know him? And then the fourth was seek to do his will and actually do it. Don't, don't seek to do his will and then do what you want. Seek to do his will and then actually do it. Um, so those were the four, the four points that I made last week. And then this morning what I want to do is I want to I look at Abraham's life and see he, his life was full of some tough decisions and, and see what happened in his life and see what we can draw from uh, his life that we can sort of uh, look, look at it as well for our own lives. All right, let's uh, look at Genesis 11. We can start there, verse 27. I'm going to read four passages of scripture before I actually kind of get into this. This is um, Genesis 11. This is verse 27. This is the account of Terah's family. Terah was the father of Abram. Remember, his name was Abram before God changed his name to Abraham. Nahor and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. But Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, the land of his birth, while his father Terah was still living. Meanwhile, Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sari, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. Milcah and her sister Iska were daughters of Naah's brother Haran. But Sarah was unable to become pregnant and had no children. One day, Terah took his, took his son Abram, his daughter-in-law Sarah, his son Abram's wife, and his grandson Lot, his son Haran's child, and moved away from Ur of Chaldeans. He was headed for the land of Canaan. But they stopped at Haran and settled there. Terah lived 205 years and died while still in Haran. Okay. Let's go to Acts chapter 7, verse 2. This is Stephen talking. It says, this is Stephen's reply, brother and father, listen, brothers and fathers, listen to me. Our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. God told him, leave your native land and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. So Abraham left the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran until his father died. Then God brought him here to the land where you now live. 
You read chapter, I mean, uh, verse 4 again. So Abraham left the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran until his father died. Okay, let's look at Joshua, chapter 24, verse 2. Joshua said to the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Naor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods. But I took your ancestor Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him into the land of Canaan. I gave him many descendants through his son Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I gave the mountains of Seir while Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Again, it says, Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods, meaning they were idol worshippers. Okay, Genesis 12. Verse 1 says, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Okay. Why is this such a tough decision for Abram to leave? Well, one thing first, let me just say this. It's interesting in the scriptures we see that rarely in the Bible will you get everything about what God is saying about a topic or a person from one scripture. I, I just read to you four scriptures, and all four of these scriptures had something to say about Abram, right? So if you only use one scripture, you're only going to get a piece of the pie. So it's important that when we're looking at the Bible and studying the Bible, we got to realize that there are multiple aspects of every story, and, and we kind of need to do our due diligence to make sure we got it right. So it's a tough decision because Abram had to leave everything that identified him. Everything that identified him, he had to leave. Everything with which he identified, he had to leave. We don't, we don't often think about this, which is, which is why I'm talking about it today. Um, essentially, Abram had to lose his identity. He had to lose his identity. Okay, well, Kevin, what do you mean he had to lose his identity? So much of our life is made up of what's around us and not necessarily who we are, right? For example, we can identify ourselves with where we live, with who our friends are, with how we look, we can identify ourselves with our job, how much money we make. We can identify ourselves with our race and nationality, right? There's so many things in our lives that we attach ourselves to that give us identity more than we realize. I'm a mother, I'm a, I'm a son, I'm an uncle, I'm a this, I'm a that. And if we're not careful, our identity is in all of these things that we're affiliated with or to. That's not necessarily a bad thing, except does it diminish 
the identity that we get from him. See, we, we can be Christians and we can actually never identify as belonging to him. That's our truest identity. That's our truest identity. But in this world, right, Facebook and Instagram, we want everybody to know this is who I am. And guess what? Who you're telling everybody else you are may not at all be who you are. And so it's easy for us to identify with so many external things, situations, people, places, whatever. It's no different for Abram, right? He is the, you know, back then, you know, if, if, you, were, if, you, if you were a child, they want to know, well, who are you? The first thing you say, well, I am the son of, and then you list your father. My name is Sydney. I'm the daughter of Kevin and Tony Cook. My name is Christopher. I am the son of Kevin and Tony, right? So you, 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 you always identified yourself with who you were related to, usually your father and your mother. His father and his family worshipped idols. So his identity was one of idol worshiping. God said to him, we read it, God said to him while he was still in Mesopotamia, leave your people, leave your father's household, leave your, your country, and I am going to show you a land of where you need to go. But on this way, the Bible says that they settled in Haran, which tells me Abram wasn't able to completely leave his culture, his family, uh, his, his, his country. He wasn't, he wasn't completely able to leave because on his way, he settled. He was so attached that he couldn't move beyond his family. The Bible says he didn't leave until his father died. We don't actually know when he got this word from God. What we do know is that he was 75 when he left. He actually could have been 40 when he got the word. He, he could have been 50 when he got the word. He could have been 60 when he got the word. We don't know. We know from the time he got the word to the time he left, a, 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 a tremendous amount of time lapsed. And he didn't do exactly what God wanted him to do right away. Why? Because he was attached to his identity. Imagine tomorrow you wake up no job, no family, not even sure where you are, you would be like, who, the question is, who am I? Like when you, when you introduce yourself to somebody, say, this is who I am, and what is the first thing they ask you? What do you do? Right? So what we're doing is we're giving them identity about our job. They, don't, they didn't ask you who you are. They said, what do you do? And then they say, oh, you are an ex. So now you get a label. So we identify this person as an ex. That's what they do. That's not who they are. You, you, you with me? So Abram is finding it difficult to cut the apron strings and actually go forward and do what God wanted him to do. It says he settled. 
in Haran. You know, one of the things that I always tell new Christians, not to be mean, but to give them uh, a leg up in their new, their new life in God. Friends you had, stop hanging out with them. What you used to watch on TV, push pause. As much as you can, read the Bible, be in church for a season of time. For a season of time, eliminate all these other things that identified you and you identified with. Why? Because God is trying to imprint on you your new identity. And what's so hard for people is to leave their identity, especially the people they used to hang out with. I'm, I'm not saying you just got to completely uh, do away with them, but if they're not walking the same way you're walking, sorry, I'll see y'all. I see y'all, because what's going to happen? They're going to keep trying to pull you back and pull you back and pull you back, and you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle with your new identity. And because it's new, you haven't built up the, 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 uh, the wherewithal to be able to say, oh, I don't need that. I, 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 I can still relate to them and still do what I want to do in God. No, not really. No, not really, you can't. So you're not being mean. You're just, you're just making sure you're honoring the new identity that you have in God. So finally, Abram has, once his father dies, years later, once his father dies, he decides to leave. And here's what God says to him. I am going to bless you. I'm going to make you famous Everybody that, you, everybody that blesses you, I'm going to bless them. Everybody that curses you, I'm going to curse them. You're going to be a blessing to all the people on earth. God is telling him what his new identity is going to be. He's expressing to him to say, this, Abram, is now who you are. But I couldn't do that while you were still with these people who worship idols. Because you come from a people who worship idols. It may sound selfish, and it may even be selfish, but, but God isn't going to share his identity with anybody else. We either have to decide, I'm this in God, or I'm that. Decide. If God is saying, if you're going to be this in me, then this is what your life is going to be like. If you choose not to do that, then this is what your life is is going to be like. So Abram leaves. Why this is so difficult? Because it's about identity. And we don't realize how steeped in things around us that our identity is rooted. We don't realize it. We don't. So when it comes to making a decision, a very difficult decision, that actually has to do with how I identify myself, but actually has nothing to do with who I am in him, how am I going to relate to that decision that I have to make? You see what I mean? If I can cut, if I can cut this, 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 this relationship, this, this false identification that I have with people, places, and things that actually don't define who God says I am, if, if, I, can, if I can put those in the right perspective, and when the tough decision comes along, I'm able to make that decision 
based on who God says I am, not who I've determined I want to be. See, here's, here's the worst thing. The worst thing in the world that we can do is come up with our own identity. This is who I am. This is who I'm going to be. This is how I defined myself. Okay, what was the first thing that I said that I taught you last week? And what was the song we sang today? That we don't belong to ourselves. So if you don't belong to yourself, then what's this whole me thing then about? What, what's that about? Me, 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 me. What's that about? To be you, 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 you. See, the decisions, the tough decisions that we've got to make, that God expects us to make, are going to cut through all of that stuff. All of that stuff. And however difficult it is, however attached we may be, God expects us to do what he wants us to do. Period. Period. You guys know that I worked at a job for 27 years. God says, okay, yeah, it's time to go. The good thing about it was my identity wasn't in my job, wasn't in my title, wasn't in anything. My identity was in him. So when he said, it's time to go, I said, okay, then. Let's go. See, we, we, we will always get tested. Okay. Anything, anything and any person that runs counter to how God is identifying us, God is going to start bringing separation. Anything or anybody that runs counter to God's identity for your life, God is going to bring separation. So that means if you want to stay attached to whatever that is, you're going to have to disobey God. You're going to have to step across the line of how God has identified you and say, God, I don't want that identification that you've given me. I'm going to step across the line, and I'm going to create an identity for myself, and I'm going this way even though you want me to go this way. It's called disobedience. And Christians do it every day. Second major decision Abraham had to make. Uh, turn, uh, sorry, well, let me just say, you should always bring your Bible to church, even if it's on your phone. You should bring something just in case the technology doesn't work like this. Um, let's see. Genesis 16, verse 1. It says, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, 
but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. So God, so, so go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarah's proposal. So Abram, so Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So Abram had sexual relations with Hagar, and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. Then Sarah said to Abraham, this, was all, this is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. Abraham replied, look, she is your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarah treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. What's so tough about this decision? Well, in chapter 15, God says to Abram, you're going to have a, a child from your own body, meaning you and Sarah are going to have your own child. It won't be from one of your servants. It's going to be from your own body. Okay. So, Sarai has this idea, this scheme, because she's impatient. Be be because she's impatient, she decides to come up with her own plan. Because she's impatient, she decides to come up with her own plan and tells her husband, Abram, go sleep with my, my maidservant. You can get pregnant. She can get pregnant, and then we'll have a family through her. And here's the really, really bad part about that. Abram agrees with it, and he does it. Being impatient will cause us to lack confidence in the word of God that he's already spoken to us. We'll dismiss the word of God and develop our own plan for what we think is going to happen, should happen, and be so far out of the will of God that we totally miss God. Totally miss God. So now, this bad decision that they make creates all this drama in their life drama that you just can't get rid of like that. So now the Sarah is upset, Sarah a is upset because Hagar is pregnant and ha Hagar is saying, nah, 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 I'm pregnant, you not. So now Sarah is mad, but because Sarah is the master and Hagar is the, the servant, she treats Hagar poorly. Now Hagar is upset and Abram is saying, look, not my thing. Do whatever you want to do with her. And eventually, she runs away. So, so, she, so nobody has the, Hagar's got the kid. Sarah still don't have the kid. And their family is messed up. And they've got all this bitterness and resentment going on because nobody wanted to wait for God. I, I don't, I'm tired of waiting for God. So I'm going to create my own idea about what I want to do. Really? You really want to do that? Well, they did. 
They actually do. Here's the thing that's interesting about this story. Abraham is 86 years old at this point. He's 86. We know, because the Bible tells us, that he's 100 years old when he actually has Isaac, when he and Sarah have Isaac. So it's a 14-year difference. He's, he's 86 right now. I don't believe that God was waiting until uh, Abram turned 100 years old for him to have a child. I don't believe that. I believe he could have had a child the next year after this situation or before, before this situation. I think what pushed it longer was his own disobedience. See, I believe God has a time frame. The Bible says uh, at just the right time, Jesus came into the world. Right, just at just the right time. The Bible says for 430 years to the very day, uh, the, the Israelites left Egypt. Right, so God has a very specific time frame of how long we're to be in something. But we actually can prolong how long we're going to be in something. And I don't believe that God's idea was for Abram to be 100 years old. I believe he could have did it when he was 86 or 87. I believe it got pushed to him being 100 years old because he was disobedient. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes the issue of time has to do with us more than it has to do with God. has to do with us more than it has to do with God. So what Jay said this morning, we've got to make sure that we evaluate our lives and make sure that our lives are in keeping with what he wants for the life. And where we need to make adjustments, we need to make adjustments. But I don't, I don't necessarily believe that God was waiting for Abram to be 100 years old before he had a child. I believe God could have did it then. But it got pushed 14 years. What he, what he should have done, Abram, what he should have done is he should have said to Sarah, look, I know you want a child. I want one. Here's what God said to us. Let's rehearse what God said to us. He said that between you and me, he was going to give us a child from your body, from our bodies. This is what he said to me. Let's pray and ask God to strengthen us to be obedient to that word and let's dismiss this word that you developed with your servant Hagar. That's not the will of God. That's what Abram should have said to Sarah. He didn't. Now his life, his life, her life, Hagar's life is full of drama. Okay. Decision number three. Uh, Genesis 22, verse 1. This is kind of long. But let me read it anyway. It's important. Uh, sometime, sometime later, right? So now we're talking a lot of times, a lot later, because now uh, Isaac is born. Sometime later, God tested. You see that? God tested. God tests us. Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, 
your only son, which means God did not recognize Ishmael as being his true son because it was something that he manufactured. It wasn't something that God manufactured. It was something that he manufactured, and God didn't recognize Ishmael as his true son. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkeys, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there. This is the first place the word worship is used in the Bible. We will worship there. There's no singing. Guess what there is? Obedience. So worship has to do with obedience. We will worship there and we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the, top, as the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abram and Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, we have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where's the sheep for the burnt offering? Smart boy. God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told them to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way. For now I know you are truly, that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Then Abram looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in its place, uh, in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh, Yah Yahweh Yira, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, People still use the name as a proverb, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the, of the Lord called again to Abraham from, from heaven. This is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld your son, your only son, I swear by my, own, my name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies, and through your descendants, all nations on the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. Then they returned to the servants and placed their back to Beersheba, where Abraham continued to live. Okay. What's tough about this decision? It's pretty clear. Abraham had been waiting for a long time, long time, decades, to have a son. He gets the son. He lives with the son. He plays with the son. They play, they play catch together in the backyard together. Right? They go fishing together. And then now God says to him, okay, now I want you to sacrifice him. Take your son, your only son, and go and sacrifice him. What? Abraham's response is this. He got up early the next morning and left to go do it. Now, Let's look at that compared to when God told him at the beginning, leave your father's household, leave your country, leave your people, and go to a place where I've called you to go. 
Years and years and years went by, and he couldn't do it because he was so attached. Here is a demonstration of Abraham's growth and development and, and faithfulness in God. You, you, you see, the, you, you, you see the, the, the development here on a continuum. That he now is able to do something that, that actually is harder to do than him leaving. Now the, the, the only son that you have, you want me to go and sacrifice him? Yeah, okay, I'm going. He got up early the next day and decides to go and do it. He's got the knife at the apex getting ready to come down and kill this boy. And the angel of the Lord speaks to him and said, Abraham, slow your hand. We can see the shift in Abraham. Tough decision. Tough decision. What it, God says, go and sacrifice your son, the one you love so much. Don't think for a minute God won't test you with what you love so much. Okay? Don't think for a minute he won't test you. Right? If, if, if like I said, anything or anybody that comes in between him, there's going to be some separation. He, he's going to seek to separate. The, the boy you love so much, go take him and sacrifice him. God's testing him to see if he's willing to do it. Would we be? Would, would we go and sacrifice the thing that we've waited so long for? And God says, okay, I just want you to walk away from it. I want you to leave it. I want you to sacrifice it. I want you to give it away. We're not doing that anymore. We're doing something different. Do, do we have a love of God that's so strong and so profound and so one that we would be willing to just walk away from that? Well, guess what? He's going to test you in it to see. It's a test. He wants to see whether or not you can pass the test. These decisions that are difficult, these same kinds of decisions are in our lives. And I believe God is testing us to see, let's see. I've got, I've got these blessings that I want to give them, but let's see if they're ready for them yet. Let's see if they're willing to part with what they love so much. Last scripture, Hebrews 11, verse 17. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice. as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted, Abraham, listen to this, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. This is why Abraham is called the father of faith. Because he's getting ready to do something that is actually unthinkable. Will you? Will you be ready to do something that's just so unthinkable, to demonstrate your love for God, your faith for God, your trust in God, will you do it? 
or will you compromise? This is all about being kingdom people and making kingdom decisions as kingdom people. So when these tough decisions come up on us, then actually define our identity in him, we've got to be prepared. No, this is who I am. And I, I just can't cross that line. I, I, I can't cross that line. Other people may be able to. Okay. But I can't cross that line because this is who I am. As difficult as these decisions are in our lives, God expects us to make them first and foremost with him in mind, with, with him leading us and guiding us. Doesn't matter how attached you are to the person, place, or thing. This is real. This, these kinds of decisions can jack your life up, man, can mess your life up if you're not trusting God and not waiting on God. Your life can get just messed up. It doesn't mean that God can't correct it, but he's not just going to correct it like that. He's not going to snap his fingers and be like, okay, it's back to the way it was. No, 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 no. It doesn't go back the way it was. You got yourself in this mess. Now you got to work with God to get yourself out of it. But it's a process. Listen, it's a process without all the drama. We don't want to add drama. Making decisions as kingdom people. Got one more message, I think. I heard God right for next week regarding this. Um, let's stand.